Thank you, everyone. Thank you for um, your offerings just now. So I too would like to acknowledge the um, Aboriginal elders of Wurundjeri, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to also really acknowledge the Aboriginal women that have spoken here today um, and really kind of acknowledge that Aboriginal women have been at the forefront of responding and resisting violence and I yeah, really honour that. So actually what I'd first like to do before I... I've got a list of questions, um, but I really would like to give you all an opportunity to think about questions. So what I'm going to invite you to do now on your table is just to have a quick one-minute conversation on the table if there's a question that is coming to you that you would like to offer to the panellists. OK, I'll get you to come back together. That was a quick one minute. Who has a question that they'd like to ask? Has anyone else got questions? Just noticing one. Um, we had a question for Tani. Um, because I, I don't work in, sort of have anything to do with the legal sector at all, but something that you were saying about the difference between crime and harm made me think that that was a really interesting idea that I would appreciate if you could sort of speak some more about that. I, I think that, like, when we say that it's a crime, we're depending on the police and the prisons and the court systems to deal with the violence that is occurring in, um, in families or in, in relationships. And I think what we need to focus on is actually reducing harm and not actually leaving it for the police and court to deal with. We need to look outside of the usual, um, t the, the usual ways of dealing with violence and not rely on the state because the state is inherently violent and that's what I'm kind of talking about and I think as well when you're talking about harm it's actually um, we're talking about the the things that happen interpersonally um, to, within relationships um, and I think that yeah that's kind of what I meant by the difference between harm and crime. Um, I think yeah uh, the difference between Crime and harm is something I think about a lot and I think it's very useful in any space, if, you know, especially in the people space because we're talking about the magnitude of harm, the lethality of harm, the level of community harm as well that happens when an individual woman experiences a high level of structural oppression. For example, with those statistics that you saw earlier about the increase in women in prison, almost half of those women are there on remand. So the change in bail laws has created a bottleneck in the system where there are women who are currently incarcerated awaiting sentencing. Many of them would never be sentenced to prison time when it does come time for their matter to be heard. But in the meantime, they're in prison long enough to lose their job, to lose their home, to lose their children, to be branded a criminal, to undergo that internal and external stigma and discrimination, potentially lose ties to their community. And if we're talking about, again, the prevention of men's collusion and a normalisation of their violence against women, if one of the only places she can expect to have her level of systemic discrimination understood and validated and affirmed is the perpetrator, then that creates a very, very dangerous us and them dichotomy that is absolutely a weaponization of the system that we as PIVO workers have the capacity to intervene in and avoid and take an explicit stance against in our work. Do you have anything you want to offer? No? Was there a Giselle's got a question. Were there any other questions up the back? Uh, firstly, I wanted to thank you all. I mean, I thought they were all very, very powerful and incredible um, discussions that you raised. Um, this, my question is for everybody on the panel. Um, and it, it relates to kind of what we were talking about at the start and then what you each touched on as well, which is the inherent violence of the system, the inherent violence of the institution of police, um, and then kind of again linking to what Lydia and Carla and others said at the start, which is the system does what it's designed to do. So in that context, right, how do we hold that and this idea of police accountability? What does police accountability mean when 
we're talking about a system that is inherently violent. I mean, it's a phenomenal question, and I think often when we're having those conversations, we're necessarily in the dual terrain, right, of a spro of kind of response and the situation that we're in now and the alternatives and what we imagine and are investing in building for the future. And so I think when we consider police accountability, I certainly consider that to be a kind of short-term stopgap while we do the work that we need to build the responses that we need that exist outside the prison industrial complex. I don't presume that they exist already. I think that one particular, <clears throat> you know, excellent way of thinking about I think when we're thinking about responses to family violence and responses to harm, often we can feel quite crippled by like what we can do. And so one of the things we've done historically is to sort of outsource it to police and prisons and services as if it's the work of outside experts when it's not. And that's something that the PVOR sector really gets, is that it's fundamentally our business. But when we think about those responses to crisis moments or types of harm, we're often thinking in a really immediate sense as opposed to thinking, well, if we knew that an incidence of harm was going to occur in our community or in a relationship in three to five years, what would we need to do to be able to create the conditions to respond to that harm? And I think that's the kind of movement work and the conversation that needs to happen in parallel with considering what we do right now to minimise harm um, for people who are experiencing violence. You know, and police accountability at the moment kind of sits in that. And I think we're trying to do that in a number of ways, kind of individually responding to particular instances of, of harm, so state harm against survivors, but also at a kind of systemic level, having you know mounting strategic litigation to mount the argument that police should owe a duty of care to survivors in family violence situations, which is something that Andrew's government argues that they shouldn't. <laughs> but I think that's what we're doing, is we're doing that work in tandem, the work of, of holding the current situation and then, and then building alternatives. Um, is this on? Yeah. I think as well the only possible way to do it is solidarity. You know, I really resonated with what you said about there being no ethical job. You know, we are, there is no outside the system, we are all in some ways working within it. And in many of us in our, you know, in our careers have come to the system from a place of its history, which was, just, you know, the whole family violence system positioned itself as working with women, alongside women, against the system. And then because of the changes in context, in political context, and, you know, the tendering, the competitive tendering for funding, we find ourselves in a position of fighting over crumbs, of fighting against each other, and there is no escaping that. And that, if we are to stay true to our ethics, that causes us real pain. And in order to maintain any kind of fire or vigour or possibility of continuing to work on dismantling the oppressive systems from the outside, we need solidarity. And we need to step in that to do that discomfort and let go of this. I think we get stuck in this like tyranny of perfection and the search for the perfect ally. There's no such thing. But the cause, if you zoom out far enough, it becomes a cause about anti-capitalism or it becomes a cause about, you know, bring down the prison industrial complex that is so much bigger than ourselves. And yes, big in its overwhelm, but also big in its possibility to unite us and to be a place, a cradle for that solidarity that will enable us to push this work forward whilst we continue to work within the system when disrupted from the inside as well. Which kind of links one of my questions. Do you want to add to that before I ask one? No. I suppose I was thinking how, what are the practices of solidarity then? Like we're, if the systems that we're working within, and most of us are based in organisations that receive funding, that, you know, we're embedded in it, what are practices of solidarity that um, organisations can start considering in these contexts? Because I think, um, you know, you've raised a lot of tensions and a lot of, you know, a lot needs to change. So what are some really practical acts of solidarity that you can see people, you know, stepping into? <laughs> pay the rent, pay the money. But I think also affirmative hiring, you know? Like, is there, are there, you know, who is on our boards? Who are they representing at the highest level of our organisation? Who is on our boards and who is an under, uh, underpaid or not paid consultant? You know, if we're talking about organisations in the capitalist context, then we need to ask, start asking ourselves the pointy questions. You know, why do we get a paid holiday and invasion day? Why don't people come in and work and then our wages get donated to the warriors of Aboriginal resistance? There's a practical strategy. There are so many ways that we could be making ourselves less comfortable in our work, but more comfortable in the sense of being truer to the ethics and ideally the ethics that brought us here in the first place. But yeah, I think there's some, there's some really good resources online for ways to start paying that rent and practicing solidarity. But I think that, yeah, it probably requires, uh, you know, less comfort 
and, and finding solidarity outside our organisations. It's really scary to be the one to stick your neck out. But I believe that there are models, there are existing models for that happening successfully. There's really good partnerships usually happening between very small, tiny micro organisations like Flat Out and like Flemchem and, you know, um, the storytelling project. So, yeah, do your research. Talk to small local autonomous groups in your area. Research online. Look to the amazing Indigenous activism that's already doing incredible work across this country on the smell of an oily rag and start there. And I think another thing that's important is that um, we are talking, like, yeah, speak to the activists. I think that the activists need to, talk, to speak to people in policy. I think people need to work more collaboratively to come up with solutions that are community-led and that are grassroots-led. Mm -hmm. okay. I was thinking about perhaps, you know, you're thinking bringing forward the stories of the women that you were speaking about, you know, that you work with in your group. What were some of the things that they might actually want to be put forward, like if you were to kind of bring their voices to the room? I think that um, these women, I th they're on like an abolitionist road at the moment mm -hmm. and that they honestly just want the world to be better. Mm -hmm. They want to live in a world where there isn't violence and they want to live in a world where people respect each other and we look after each other. And, you know, and I think that in lots of, you know, um, working class suburbs, that happens all the time. Like, as a kid, you'd go ask the neighbour for some milk and bread if you had nothing. And that just doesn't happen anymore because we're being gentrified out of our neighbourhoods and we, ca we can't rely even rely on our neighbours anymore to support us. And that, it in turn, prevents violence. So I think if the women were to come here, that they would say that they, you know, want that. They want, you know, kids to be able to be kids. They want, you know, them to be able to live in a world without prisons and that's um, what they would want and they, yeah, that's what they'd want. Are there any other questions that people would like to, yes, can I can um, run a microphone? That was really terrific, thanks everybody. Um, my name is Neil Minnie, I'm from Wired. I'd like to um, acknowledge that I'm a migrant settler of colour living in Australia. Um, I'm picking up the idea of um, Royal Commission, which I call Royal Omission. When you think about follow the money, as Giselle was saying, always follow the money, we think about who made their money on the Royal Commission. Mm. And classically, it's the way they took over the third world after formal colonization is by NGOs. And there you have a takeover situation. Now, there's so much investment made into the Royal Commission. Meanwhile, there's no treaty, there's no people getting um, their payments back for stolen generations. So when the state looks like it's doing something good, need to always look at what else it's doing, but how do we, after such a deep investment into that for the last few years since the Royal Commission, how can we backtrack, how can we move away from that, not be complicit in, in that? That's one part of the question. The other one is that not all of us are symmetrically placed in that system, and there are a lot of, you can never take over a system without elite and a lot of privilege and rewards being given money, boards, top jobs, CEO positions. So we, the we here, may not be the we that is running those organisations. So for me, like when you're talking about tyranny, there is a tyranny of white domination as well and white elitism that we never get to talk about. Race is always about the people of colour. Actually, race is also about the domination and that we are not all, can't, we can't all be activists in there because some of us just aren't. So I just wondered if you could talk back about, number one, how to roll back from something that I know we're so deeply committed in and signed up to, and we've lost the battle already. And the second one is how do we break down the elitism within the organisations? Yeah, that is a bloody huge question. Um, wow. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, I think it comes back to actually building communities to be able to work in these spaces. And I think that we need to prioritise working with communities on the ground and locally. And I, I think that that is the way that we'll be able to, um, you know, take over 
um, organisations that will be more successful because it will be the people who are operating inside those communities, who know those communities, to be able to do that. And that's what's happened in the Aboriginal service sector. Um, I mean, obviously there's still elitism there, but um, at the end of the day, at least every, pretty much every CEO of the Aboriginal um, led organisation in the state mostly is Aboriginal, you know? I think, yeah, again, it just comes back to solidarity. And I think that there is, we're at an interesting point politically where there's this real focus on integrated service and intersectionality that is seen, you know, mainstream, for want of a better word, larger organisations and primary health networks and so on explicitly asked to draw on the knowledge and the wisdom and the practice frameworks of smaller specialised organisations. And I think that where bigger, for example, PIVO organisations can come in is advocating, contacting the smaller specialised organisations and peak bodies in their catchments, asking them how they do business, and then standing and buttressing for them and making sure that in doing so they're not co-opted, they're not watered down, they're not lip service, that they are paid, that they are valued, and that the organisations who adopt their frameworks and want to tout about this intersectional integrated service model, you know, what's the use of a larger organisation then partnering with a smaller organisation if the workers in that larger organisation don't remember the last time they had supervision you know hands up anybody so I think this is a real opportunity for um, bigger mainstream organizations to advocate that in the process these very um, integrated community-based um, specialist service models are not watered down and that if bigger organizations want to partner or merge or integrate then they're the ones who actually need to lift the bar and they need to be accountable and transparent does that make sense I think there's um, good advocacy to be done and bodies that we need on the front line in that space. Otherwise, I fear that that's what will happen and that smaller, smaller organisations will have to kind of barnacle onto bigger ones to survive and in the process lose the work that they've, you know, the practice frameworks that they've worked so hard to develop over such a long time. I think in answer to that question, what I really think about is it being a co like a co-option moment that you're talking about. You know, we're really good as a sector at talking about acts of resistance at the kind of interpersonal level, but thinking about what our collective acts of resistance are to co-option, I reckon, is what we're talking about and what the practices and ethics are of that. And so when I think about it, you know, I kind of go to police policing because that's where I'm working but I think then about what it means for us to resist co-option you know there's all of this push to build relationships to co-locate what that means for the people that we support but I think one of the practices is truth telling where we absolutely tell the truth about the lived experience of policing we're not influenced by relationships in a way that means that we won't do that and then also thinking about what criteria we apply to our own work that resists co-option so I think that's about applying criteria like decarceral criteria to the tactics that we use you know if work is going to result if our work is going to result in more people being criminalized more women being criminalized don't do it you know it's a tactic we won't do you know in applying that criteria to all of the work that we do will it locate power with communities or will it locate more power with police or prisons or the state you know if it's the former then we do it if it's the latter then we don't do it so I think it's also a real moment for our kind of internal clarity and in thinking about the ways that we resist that sort of co-option Were there any other questions around? How much longer have we got? <coughs> any final reflections from the panel or? No? Okay, so I think we're coming to a close for this session and we're actually gonna roll on to the next one quite quickly, is that right? Thank you to all three panelists.